Half a day. This is a great event. Uh, you know, we were worried a little bit that if we had it at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, nobody would show up. From now on, all of our events at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and all of them will feature Leo. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll have a good, good-sized crowd. It's a pleasure to be uh, in front of you. Uh, you know, I, it's a little hard to introduce a person that uh, needs really no introduction to most of you. Um, and so it's uh, very rare, you know, he, uh, I was having a conversation with uh, Leo, and he was telling me that uh, he used to work at the Guam legislature, and that uh, this is where he came up with these ideas. And I said, wow, who knew that working at the legislature could be so productive? <laughs> 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 and so there, and there is proof, proof positive right here. And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, um, um, mo most of you know uh, that, you know, he's, uh, he's a leading blogger, you know, I think, you know, some, depending on how you count the metrics, he has uh, two, two million followers in his blog, you know. So I've asked him, if I join your blog, would you promise not to sell my information to Donald Trump? <laughs> and he said, yeah, he, he wouldn't make that commitment. But, <laughs> but he doesn't sell his information. He doesn't even have any ads on the, on the blog. That's, that's pretty amazing. But, you know, basically, uh, Leo has returned home. He's a graduate of the University of Guam. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he's a son of Guam. And, you know, he, he writes that uh, one, in, in one of the interviews about him, he, the interviewer said, Zen Habits creator Leo Babauta believes that having no goals let you experience life and work more fully, more intensely as you concentrate on that journey. That's, that's, the, that's what my children always told me. I have no goals <laughs> so I can enjoy my life more fully. But, I, if, uh, uh, but it's a kind of a remarkable um, way of looking at the world. And uh, by, by his capacity to do that and his ability to do that, in a way, he leads us down a journey that gets us to be a little bit more introspective. He's a simplicity blogger and author. He created Zen Habits, a top uh, 25 blog. He uh, uh, was listed in uh, Time Magazine uh, uh, as a top blogger for a couple of years. He's also a best-selling author, a husband, a father of six children, and a vegan. And, uh, in another one of those uh, kind of oppositional concepts that you try to get your arms around, he moved from Guam to San Francisco to live a more simple life. <laughs> 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 so here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Leo. Thank you. What a beautiful crowd. <laughs> Did you guys only let in the attractive people? That might be a uh, discrimination. Um, I know you guys came here just to listen and you thought I'd be doing all the work, but I'm gonna ask you guys to do a few things. Um, so the first one is to silence your phones and if you can, try not to use them while we're here. Let's just stay present with each other in this room. And uh, if you want to take some pictures of the slides, you can do that. But otherwise, let's just try and be technology free for a little bit. Um, the second one is let's close our eyes. Put everything down that you're holding. Allow your eyes to come to a close. And just notice what's going on in your body. What kind of energy are you feeling right now? What are you bringing with you into this room? Are you excited, bored, stressed out by work or school? Are you feeling good and happy? Are you grieving a loss? What does that feel like in your body right now? whatever it is that you're noticing. Just notice the sensations in your body. 
How do your legs feel? What sensations can you notice in your legs? What do you notice in your torso? Can you feel your breath moving your body up and down? And what is the texture of that breath? As each breath comes into your body and leaves, that's the only time that'll happen. And each one is different. So just notice that particular breath right now. And as you're noticing the breath and the sensations in your body, welcome whatever you find like you would a good friend into your house uh, with that Chamorro hospitality. Just welcome that. Notice and welcome. Allow yourself to arrive in this space. With me, with the amazing people here with you. So, you can open your eyes. Thank you for meditating with me. How many of you guys have meditated before? All right, a good number. And, uh, and welcome back to the meditation. How many of you have never meditated before today? All right. Um, well, I'm glad we did it together. So, um, I have about 45 minutes to talk, and then we are going to do some Q&As. So you guys can ask questions after that. But the first talk, uh, the first part of the talk is going to be my story. Uh, Dr. Underwood shared a little bit of that. But I want to give you guys just a glimpse of that, just so you know where I'm coming from, who I am. And, uh, and also maybe for some of the young students here, maybe there will be some inspiration there. Maybe it'll just be another story of how there's possibility of doing something creative from Guam. So I want to kind of share where that came from. So actually, let's try closing our eyes again. <laughs> so we're going to close our eyes. I'm going to ask you guys to do a creative exercise. You're going to imagine yourself as someone else. You are a young man living here on Guam. And you are handsome. Uh, you are. <laughs> You're a writer. You write for the Pacific Daily News. And you um, maybe eventually move on to the Guam legislature. And so you're a writer, but you don't actually believe in yourself. You don't believe that you can make it as a writer in the bigger world outside of Guam. You think, maybe I need to go to New York and, and write a novel or work for the New York Times, but I don't think I can actually do that. So you stay in your comfort zone. You stay in the safety of your home with your family here, everything that you grew up with and you know, and you stay there because that feels good and you know that you're going to fail if you try anything else. So you're this writer. You don't believe in yourself. And that lack of belief in yourself, that lack of belief in your worth, it spreads to everything in your life. You don't believe in yourself when it comes to sticking to a, an exercise plan. So you maybe try it and you give up after a week. You don't believe in yourself when it comes to changing your diet. You're addicted to junk food, but you never believe that you can actually stick to something different and change your life. And so you start to gain weight. You start to also accumulate debt and clutter. And this becomes very stressful. You become overworked with not enough time for your family, your beautiful family. So this lack of belief starts to spread to every part of you and starts to uh, change your entire life into a place where you're just not happy with yourself or where you are with your procrastination and your distraction, with your laziness. That's how you characterize it. And that doesn't feel good. You feel guilty about yourself every day. So in this story, this is where we start. Now I want you to imagine the first turning point. There's a couple. 
The first turning point is you decide you have to make a change. You're a smoker, you've tried seven times to quit, and you just can't make that stick, but you're like desperate here because you need to save your life. And it's not just your life that you're saving, but it's your wife because she's gonna go back to smoking after she gives birth. It's your kids because they're gonna smoke when they grow up around a smoking dad. And so you pour everything you can into this one change. You have a million things you want to change about your life, but you pour everything into this one change. You research it, you make a promise to your wife and your, your daughter, and you decide there's nothing that's going to stop you. And actually, the first week into it, you fail. But that's not going to stop you. That failure is not going to stop you. So you keep pouring yourself into it, and you actually make it work. You make it happen. Just imagine what that does to your feeling about yourself, this lack of belief in yourself. Now there's one success that you can feel is true, is an actual real success. So you have the success, and you say, I'm going to make the next thing stick. So you start running. And uh, that running, you couldn't even run 10 minutes because you're so out of shape. But you keep doing it keep doing it and you keep following some principles that you're learning about and then you actually stick to it for a month. Eventually you run a 5K. Eventually you run your first marathon with a guy who's in this room, Ken Murphy. And uh, you, you make it to that marathon but along the way you actually start to change other things as well. You change your diet, you start to eat healthier, eat vegetables instead of Big Macs. You actually become vegetarian, as shocking as that might be for you. Um, you start to get out of debt, slowly climbing out of debt, one debt at a time. You start to wake up earlier and write in the morning and start to write the book that you always wanted to write. You stop procrastinating so much because now you're starting to believe in yourself. So that turning point came when you started to focus on one thing and made one success. At the end of a year, you've lost 35 pounds. You have run your first marathon ever. You have written your first book. You have stopped smoking, and you're way healthier. You've made time for your wife and kids. You've gotten rid of your clutter. You're f way further out of debt. You're along the road to being debt-free. Just imagine the exhilaration there that you feel about yourself, the celebration of yourself from that place of lack of belief, this place of guilt about who you are, to this place of believing in yourself. That was the first change. The second change came when you started to write about that. So you started a blog in the beginning of 2007. And you didn't really understand what a blog is, but you're a writer, so you're like, okay, I'm going to put something out there. And you write about these changes you're making. And at first, like, you, don't think, you don't believe in yourself enough as a writer that, to think that anybody's going to read this. But you, you actually have a couple people who, who are reading it, and they're here in this room. Your wife, Eva, your mom, Shannon, maybe your sisters and grandma. <laughs> and, and a few other friends and family eventually start to hear about it and read about it. And so eventually, you have a handful of people, but actually something catches on. And you really pour yourself into this change, this venture. And as you get more people believing in you and reading and giving you amazing feedback, you start to feel good about yourself. And by the end of the year, your entire life has changed. What you were writing about catches on with the world. It connects with people, not only here on Guam, but in other places who are seeking a simple life, simplicity in the middle of all the chaos and stress of our daily lives. They were craving it and didn't realize it until they read your blog. And you connected with them on that level. You connected with people who were looking for a way out of the stuckness of their lives. And that connection, not only did it change their lives, it changes you, because the connection goes both ways. So every connection you make, every change that these people make because of your writing, it changes you and starts to make you feel connected to the world, makes you feel alive with the possibility of what you can create with others. 
By the end of the year, you have 27,000 subscribers. You quit your day job at the Guam legislature. You sign your first book deal with a major publisher in New York. And eventually, a year later, publish that book that goes on to become a, a good seller. You sell your first ebook online that you, you wrote yourself and publish yourself. And that actually gets you out of debt. And you jump with joy. So you can open your eyes now. Can you imagine those turning points in your life that from that place of not believing to starting to believe with these successes? And then success in your your uh, career. I went on to, you know, a year later have 60,000 subscribers, then the next year 150,000, then 500,000, and then a million. But the numbers, they might sound really impressive and successful, but what this story was wasn't the story of one Chamorro boy, Chamauli boy, who, uh, who changed and believed in himself. This was a story, actually, of everybody in this room. The, the wife, the mother, the grandmother, the kids who were there supporting them, this, this man as he ran his first marathon, the people who ran with him on his different races. Um, and not only those people who were there side by side with him, but the people who read his blog, the people who supported him throughout his entire life, the people who cheered him on when he first started having success, um, the people who worked with him at the Guam legislature, um, who, uh, who influenced him in so many ways, the people who spoke to him in his high school um, and, and changed his life. And this is a story about interconnection. Even the people who, who were in this room who didn't know him, they're connected to him by like probably two degrees. And in this room, it's a story of all of us going through these changes in our lives, all of us who don't believe in ourselves but are supported by everybody else around us, all of us who are putting ourselves in a place of uncertainty, uncertainty of who we are, whether we're worthwhile, whether we can make it, whether we can succeed in business or in politics or in school if you're seeking a degree um, with a new nonprofit organization that you're putting out there, as a teacher of yoga, as a mother or a father. All of these are filled with incredible uncertainty. And how do we stand alone in the middle of this uncertainty? And the truth is that we, none of us stand alone. We all are there supporting each other. And that's what the story of Leo was about. So that's part one. So thank you guys for all being here for me. Now, that story didn't end in 2008. It actually is still going on, and you guys are still a part of that story. So thank you guys. So part two is about uncertainty. And I mentioned that. It's, this is the ground of our life, is uncertainty. We all want to be in this place where, like, I know what I'm doing. I, have, I know what I'm going to do today. And I know that I can do it. But we actually never get there. We're actually in the middle of uncertainty every single day. As we wake up and pick up our phones, the first thing we do is look for some kind of answers. We're Googling things. We're looking to see if people messaged us. Like, what do I need to do today? Am I popular? Like, are people, do people care about me? Um, so this is the ground of our lives. And the truth is the ground of our lives is actually groundless. We think we, we want solid ground. But as we get older and face, like, you know, failing health, as we have kids and face like the kids going through so many things, as we have family members who are getting sick or dying, we don't have any solid ground under our feet. We're actually groundless. And so that causes a lot of trouble. So what I'm going to ask you guys to do is to practice again. I'm going to take this off. Save it for later. OK, so the first, this practice is to start by placing your hand on your heart. And you can do this with your eyes open or closed. What I want you just to notice is what's underneath that. Of course, there's your clothes. Hopefully, you're wearing clothes. Your skin. Um, but there's underneath that, there's a beating heart. There's a breath. Just notice yourself feeling that. But under that, also, you might feel the sensations of uncertainty. There are 
feelings of tightness, if you're feeling stressed, if you're feeling worried about something, if you're feeling grief. There might be feelings of energy radiating out if you're feeling some kind of excitement, if you're feeling some kind of anger. There could be a feeling of hollowness if you're feeling alone. Could be a feeling of white hot or red hotness if you're feeling some kind of rage, some kind of frustration. A lot of times we feel tightness. So notice if you feel any kind of tightness. Sometimes it's very subtle, sometimes it's very obvious. Notice the sensations, and then as you're feeling that, allow yourself to wonder, what is that? What is that thing that's in me that I don't always notice? Be curious about it. And in this wonder, this curiosity is an openness. And if you start with a tightness, which is what we normally feel when we contract from uncertainty, Wonder and curiosity opens that up. And so this is not something that needs to go away, this feeling of tightness, or this hollowness, or this radiation. It's actually just there in your body. And so we can actually practice with wonder about what that is. And wonder is not just a curiosity, it's actually an amazement at the life that's beating inside of us, the breath that fills us up. It could be a amazingly sweet breath, the sweetest breath that you've ever taken. It might be the last breath. And how amazing is that to feel that last breath and really notice it? A lot of times we don't notice what's going on, but we can pay attention and wonder. So that's the, that's the basic practice. Staying with the sensations, this is advanced practice. So I don't know if you guys are ninja level. Um, but this is... This is something that most of us don't want to do. When we start to notice things, we want to get away from it. We, how do we end the feeling that we're having, right? How do I get away from this? So maybe I'm going to, like I'm feeling stressed out, I'm going to make a list, right? Or I'm going to delegate, or I'm going to do something to take control. So we, we try and get away from this because we want it to end. But what if we just stayed with it? What if it didn't need to go away? We just stayed with it and just noticed, just kept noticing. Maybe do it for half an hour. Just stayed with it. That takes a little bit of courage, right? And so when, you, when something takes courage, give yourself encouragement. And the, word, the root of encouragement is to give yourself courage. So find encouragement to stay with that. OK. This is a truth that I have found. I didn't make this up, but this is true to me. The human mind doesn't like uncertainty or discomfort. And they're both flip sides of the same coin. So we're in the middle of this room, and you might be wondering, like, who is this guy? What is he about? And so there's a lot of uncertainty about who I am. There's also uncertainty about who you are. If I told you I'm going to bring you up to the center of this room to demonstrate something, you might feel some uncertainty for that. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's just uncertainty about what other people here are thinking about you. Um, so there's always uncertainty, and we don't like it. This is, again, the, the ground of our lives is uncertainty, and we're going to get it no matter what we like. We might set up our lives with complete comfort. right? This is something that I've done. I've set up a routine. This is exactly what I do every morning. And I have, you know, this is what I eat. This is my workout. This is my meditation. This is the place where I work. It's, it's completely controlled. And so I have complete control over my life, and I have comfort instead of discomfort. I have certainty, because I know exactly what my routine is. Then my dad dies. So that shakes up that certainty, pulls the rug out, out under your feet. And you just realize that that rug was never solid. And we don't like that. Your dad dies, and how does that feel? We want that to end. We want him to come back. We grieve. We feel pain for the death of a loved one. And this doesn't just happen with death, though. It happens with sickness. It happens as you age and you start to, like, like where's my hair going? 
<laughs> or like, where did this paunch come from, right? Um, or why aren't I as healthy as I used to be? And there's all kinds of uncertainties throughout our day. Small ones, like, you know, am I going to get this project done on time? Like, why do I keep procrastinating? What's wrong with me, right? So we don't like it. And so there are three main human responses to uncertainty and discomfort. First one is running and avoidance. This is when we are on our phones and, and being distracted, playing games, going on Netflix and YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. All of these things are modern ways of dealing with, with uncertainty and discomfort, running and avoidance. But actually, they've always existed. We've always, like you can go back to the medieval days when there were monks who would like, like, like meditate and study all day long. These guys had their ways of running. In fact, the, the studying was their way of running. They were running from the, the world of uncertainty and this was their comfort. But other people ran from that and like wanted to not do that. So there's always a pl someone who's running from something, right? So we're running and we're avoiding. When you're procrastinating, does anyone here procrastinate? Okay, a couple, couple of you guys. It's actually a universal thing. I've, I met like maybe a couple of people who say they didn't procrastinate and I think they weren't being honest with themselves. Um, so when we procrastinate, we're running, we're avoiding. When there's a difficult conversation that we're supposed to have with our boss, with our coworker, with a subordinate, with our parents, with our wives, with somebody in our lives, we avoid it most of the time. Now some of us are like, you know, we're like, Let's go and have this conversation, but most of us will put it off for at least for a little bit, maybe for way too long. So running and avoidance, elimination and control. I talked about routines. I talked about getting your office set up exactly like you want it. Um, so some people are very good at this. They make their lists. They um, try and eliminate uncertainty and discomfort, right? So we try, so let's say, is anyone here a writer? An artist, musician, a few guys, a few of you guys. Okay, have you guys ever done this one? Okay, so anybody who's ever done kind of any kind of creative work, uh, actually you have to write for the university, you know, for your, for your work here at the university, you've done this, right? We all know what that's like. But this is a completely different way of doing that. So, um, f so a writer, instead of um, running from it, might say, okay, I'm going to get my my uh, word processor set up just like I want it, right? And I'm going to uh, control all uncertainty. So I'm gonna get everything exactly set up just like I want it. So you've got everything set up, you've got you know, your, your research done, you've got everything outlined, and now you're ready to start writing. You eliminate all uncertainty, right? This, you, you actually can never do that because there's still uncertainty in the middle of your heart of like, you know, like, who am I? Can I do this? That never actually goes away, but we try. So every form of control is actually futile. There's actually no, nothing wrong with getting control and making lists and, and taking control of everything, but just know that you're actually not going to eliminate uncertainty. Um, so use it to the extent that it's uh, helpful. Okay, lashing out and resentment. So has any of you guys ever, like, gotten mad at somebody? Uh, <laughs> Lashed out at your kids or your spouse. Okay, a couple of you guys. Um, so this, and sometimes we don't lash out. Sometimes we're like, we're very good at holding it in. We still have these stories of resentment spinning around in our heads, right? So that is um, a, another, just, it's just a form of uh, dealing with that uncertainty and discomfort. It's like I, someone criticizes me, right? The uncertainty there is, well, it's uncomfortable to be criticized. But it's, the uncertainty is, am I good? Like, am I worthy? This person just criticized me, and I thought I was like this good person, and they think, like, I'm a jerk, right? Or I'm stupid, or I'm incompetent. And now there's an uncertainty there of how people see me and how I see myself, of who I am. And so I will lash, like, one of the things I'll do is lash out and say, no, you're, you're stupid, you know? <laughs> or some more mature version of that. Um, but we lash out, or we spin around a story of resentment, like, why do they have to say that? And so we, sometimes we'll run from them, but sometimes we'll, we'll do this too. 
So these are our three most common ways, and we all do all of them. Sometimes we're doing all three at once. So what is that? What do those things result in, right? Procrastination, I mentioned that. Run, that's running. Putting off exercise and meditation is actually just another form of procrastination. Has anyone ever done this? This one? <laughs> no one raised their hand. Wow. This is a really fit group. Um, overeating, this is something that I do a lot. And <laughs> Dr. Underwood raised his hand. I don't believe it. All right. Distraction. So I mentioned that phones... Our phones are uncertainty machines. As soon as we feel uncertainty, we'll pick up our phone. We might Google something to find an answer when we don't know the answer. We're just looking for some kind of distraction to, um, to keep us from thinking about the uncertainty in our lives. Busyness. Some of us are very good at, at being busy. Um, actually, I can see some people here who are like very good at it. I'm not looking at you, Heidi. Uh, no, I was kidding. Um, yeah, yeah, so we're, we're all very good at being busy, right? Um, so we can like rush around, run around doing all kinds of things except for the things that really matter, except for staying with the uncertainty. So this is a way of avoidance, actually. Uh, clutter, this is a, uh, another avoidance. So one thing I learned, I've, I've um, actually become a minimalist, not by moving to San Francisco, but <laughs> did it while I was here in Guam. And that, that is just about carrying things down to the essential, getting rid of all that hoarding that I was doing over the years. And ho clutter is actually a, it's a security, right? It's, it's a way of like surrounding yourself with something. Like if you, like my grandma grew up in the days of the depression, like you had very little, so you want to like keep things, keep things in your house. Um, and so you feel like there's some security there, right? But also like it's also avoidance because you know that there's, a lot of stuff that you need to like deal with, but you're like, ah, oh, I don't want to deal with the garage. I don't want to deal with like all those boxes that I've been piling up. And so you're avoiding it, right? So it comes with clutter, financial problems. I'm sure no one here has financial problems, um, but that's usually avoidance. That's usually um, just not, I mean, like the answer, I, I can write a book on financial, um, how to get out of financial problems and it's spend less than you earn. Uh, <laughs> so um, that's very simple, but none of us do it, right? Because we're like, oh, I can pay for this later, and so we're, we're, we're putting it off, right? Um, relationship problems, that usually comes from not, um, not doing the difficult, having those difficult conversations, right? Just really opening your heart up and being honest. But actually, a lot of it is also, um, so when you... You're facing your spouse, uh, or it could be your mom, it could be your uh, sister, or your um, son. So you're facing them, and they're doing something that you don't like. That relationship problem stems from your reaction to them. This feeling of uncertainty about who they, what they should be doing, why don't they do things the right way, and like, who am I when they criticize me? And so that's the, the root of our relationship problems. And if we just stay with it and open our hearts to them, Instead of closing our hearts, that's running is a closing of the heart. If we just stayed with them and kept, kept our hearts open, our relationship problems would go away. So that's my relationship book in, in a nutshell. <laughs> running from uncertainty comes from a limited view of life. So this is something that we're all very used to. We, we get stuck in our heads. We get stuck in this idea that the world revolves around us. It's a self-centered view, right? So we, we think, when someone criticizes us, we think, oh, they shouldn't be doing that, saying that about me, right? But instead, it's really not about us. When they cri someone criticizes you, it's actually about them, right? They're triggered. They're feeling uncertainty. They're lashing out. Instead of being like loving and open-hearted to you, they're actually reacting. And then you react to their reaction, right? So that is a self-centered view because we think they shouldn't be treating me like this. Instead of saying, oh, what, what are they going through right now? They're obviously having a bad day. They, they got triggered by something that I did unintentionally. So a limited self-centered view keeps us in uncertainty and it keeps us, run I mean, keeps us running from uncertainty instead of staying in it. So that what's the opposite view of that is opening ourselves to a much bigger view, that, that we're not alone in this world, that we're all interconnected, 
and that actually when this person is suffering, that's my brother, that's my sister, that's my mom, that's a person who I care about and I don't want them to suffer, so how can I open myself up to them, self up to them, instead of being in my closed, small, self-centered view. And we all do it, so I'm not being judgment, judgmental when I say self-centered. So it comes from a limited view of life and it's a limitation we place on ourselves. So as we run, we are feeling uncertain and we are, all of that list of things that I just showed you, that's what we're doing to ourselves. We're limiting ourselves by doing that. But instead, if we have work that we want to do in the world, if you're out to get a degree and do something amazing in this world, if you're changing the University of Guam or the island of Guam, um, if you're changing your family in some way, if you're bringing culture and history to the students of Guam and to people outside of this island, you're doing amazing work in this world, but you're limiting yourself. We often limit ourselves by running from uncertainty. And so what if we instead opened ourselves up to it and stayed in the middle of it out of a sense of devotion to what we care about, people you care most deeply about, that feeling of devotion, you can use that to keep you in it. And instead of being small, self-centered, and limited, you've now opened yourself up to something bigger than yourself. And so that's, that's the opposite view. So shifting perspective. Seeing we often, want, we often want to get away from uncertainty and groundlessness, that feeling of the rug being pulled out from under us. But actually, there's a deliciousness to it. And we can just start to see that. There is a delight in it. There is wonder in it. There are incredible benefits from it. I'm going to give you guys six. Uncertainty allows for surprise, delight, playfulness, and adventure. Now imagine if you knew exactly how life was going to go. You had no uncertainty. How boring would life be? Like if you watched a movie, you went to a movie and you knew the exact you know, plot, you knew exactly how it was going to turn out. There would be like no fun in that. If you went, like re every book you read, you knew exactly every word you were going to see because you had complete certainty about what that book was about. There would be no surprise to that. There would be no delight. There would be no adventure in that. So uncertainty allows for that. If we didn't have uncertainty, we wouldn't have all of this other great stuff. So uncertainty is actually the way that all of this stuff happens. When you go out and play with your kids, it's because you're opening yourself up to that adventurousness. Like you don't know what they're gonna, how they're going to react, but you're opening them up by playing with them, being playful. If your like, wife is criticizing you and you like, pick her up and spin her around, like, she's going to start to open her heart up to you because you've now brought playfulness into this closed-minded relationship that you guys have been in. Like, imagine that. That uncertainty was not actually a bad thing. You brought that playfulness because the uncertainty was there, this uncertainty of who you two are together. So that's the first benefit. I want you guys to remember that one because that's one of my favorite ones. Uncertainty and discomfort are the space for creativity. You can't write, you can't create music, you can't create film, you can't create laws, you can't create amazing students here at the university, you can't create anything, a, a new business, a new magazine, a new photograph, um, without pushing yourself into uncertainty and discomfort. And we all often think, I don't want to be uncomfortable, I don't like being cold, I don't like being in like pain or discomfort or like my body's aching, but actually they're completely okay. Exercise, I found out, like it's not always comfortable, but I ran a marathon with an amazing human being who's here with me, a, a few amazing human beings. Um, I actually ended up running um, an ultra marathon one time with a, a good friend of mine because I put myself into this place of creativity. What could we create together in the hills of the Marin Headlands. Um, but I wrote books because I allowed myself to be in that space. And I know a lot of people in here have done the same, um, done some kind of creative act because they put themselves in that place. So we need to remember that, remind ourselves of that when we start running. We've all done it, right? 
uncertainty and discomfort are the price of admission for the most meaningful experiences of life. And I, when I say price, I don't mean this really heavy price that you have to pay. It's actually something you're glad to pay. I talked about this 50 mile ultra marathon. I ran it with my friend Scott Dinsmore, who I met when I moved to San Francisco. Um, and this is a guy who was full of life, and he invited me to run this with him. So we trained for six months, and every, we would wake up at four in the morning to run in the dark for like 20 miles, 25 miles, uh, to train for this. When we, we started in the dark, and we finished in the dark on that day, and I, the last uh, 15 miles, I was hurt and like running through pain. And it was full, it was one of the most uncomfortable, you know, uh, uncertain moments of my life, days of my life, actually six months of my life. And yet it was the most, one of the most meaningful experiences along with, you know, the birth of my kids and other amazing things that I did that were full of uncertainty and discomfort. That was an amazing experience. He um, ended up, he was another blogger who wrote like some amazing things. He ended up going on this year round, uh, year long trip around the world with his wife. And the two of them, um, one of the things they really wanted to do, he was so excited about, was going on this hike in Mount Kilimanjaro. And they hiked up, and the last day they were about to, to peak that, that mountain, and he got hit by a boulder and died at the age of 33. So young, so full of life, so full of promise, like one of the most amazing people, um, like just so full of love and just the, the zest of life was just every day he would do that. And every run that I had with him was just like the celebration of life. And so that 50 mile ultra marathon was full of discomfort and uncertainty for me, but it was one of the most meaningful experiences of my life to be able to do that with one of my best friends. So I'm, I'm glad I, d I paid that price. And that was just one example. We, we do that every day when we put ourselves into that space. Uncertainty and discomfort create space for connection to each other, for interconnection. I talked about that closing of the heart that, that happens when we feel uncertainty and discomfort, when we feel like this person might not approve of us. And so, like, I want someone's approval, right? I want their love. I want that connection with them. But when they reject me, when they criticize me, I shut down, right? But if you can stay in this space, you actually, and if you, you both, maybe you can open up that other person by staying in that space, keeping your heart open. That interconnection that I talked about, every person in this room is helping each other through their journeys. That's the space that, that gets created by that. creates room for wonder. Wonder, I, I met a guy named Jeff who um, taught me about wonder. He said it's the, the philosophers found that it's the place before all emotion. Before emotion happens, before you get mad, angry, scared, before you get happy, excited, joyful, there's wonder there. There's a wonder, the space of like, what is this universe? What are the people who are here in front of me? What is this day going to be? Who am I? The space of like just complete awe at this life that we have. That's what wonder is, and it enables everything else. It's an appreciation for what we take for granted. And uncertainty allows for that. It's a space for the most meaningful growth in our lives. Um, I keep looking over there, my wife, who's giving me a signal that I have a few minutes left. But um, one of the hardest things for me has been growing out of my little boy self. In my marriage, we've had problems. We have a great marriage, but we have problems from time to time, just like any other marriage, right? And the problems usually come from when I'm being that little boy. When, like, she's, like, you know criticize, uh, no, upset at me for something, like imagine that, right? <laughs> Who would ever be upset with me? Um, so she's upset with me and then I, I do my little boy thing which is to run and to hide and to like not want to feel that anymore. That's my little boy self. 
my work has been to start to open my heart to her when she is feeling upset. And what's wrong with feeling upset? We all get that, right? And instead of, you know, I'm the person she trusts the most, and when she feels upset, I run away from her and tell her that I don't want that. I don't want that side of her. And so I'm rejecting her in her most vulnerable moment. And so um, if I can open my heart to her and say, I think you're beautiful when you're upset. I think you're beautiful when you're criticizing me and giving me feedback on how I can grow in my life. That's what uncertainty and discomfort um, do for you. That's where the meaning, most meaningful growth is. And it's not just in your relationships. It's anywhere. If you want to grow in your business, if you want to grow in your work in the world, if you want to grow in your relationships as a, as a person, you have to put yourself in that space, and it's actually an amazing space to be in. So I'm going to wrap up. There are the good news, despite our tendency, our mind's tendency to want to run, you can't be an entrepreneur without uncertainty. You can't run an ultramarathon without discomfort. You can't be, did I skip the thing? Oh, there we go. A parent, a teacher, a student, a creator, without both uncertainty and discomfort. They are a beautiful practice ground. So I'm using that term as a thing that you can bring up whenever it comes up for you, whenever you want distraction or procrastination, whenever you want to lash out at someone, stay in that beautiful practice ground. And I'm going to give you a practice. You have to, every good system has an amazing acronym. I have <laughs> Northwest Cola. <laughs> Just to keep it memorable. I, I'm going to, I'll work on it. Um, so the first one we've already practiced, you just notice what's going on. When you're feeling uncertainty, you'll notice that there's something coming up in you. It's like stress, it's anger, it's fear, it's, it's some kind of tightness, right? So just notice, notice the sensations. We've done this also, we've practiced welcoming. We've practiced curiosity about what, what that is. So the curiosity brings an openness. I can just stay in it with some openness, right? And this one is, I think, the magic, where the magic happens. We've now become open to it, and in this place, we can actually fall in love with that moment. We want to reject it, we want to get away from it, but we can actually fall in love with this amazing moment of being present with whatever is going on in us. And this interconnection with another human being, someone who's criticized you, someone who isn't doing the things the way that you want them to, um, this interconnection that I talked about, this journey that I was on that was supported by everybody in this room and many more, the journey that you're on that's supported by so many people in your life, that's what you're opening yourself up to in this moment. And then we have to, we can't just sit in meditation all day, you guys. <laughs> we have to act. And so when you act, you come from this place of accepting where you are, of being in love and being interconnected, being open and curious. And now you can take that intention. The intention is, I want to stay in this place. I want to stay open-hearted. I want to come to this person with love. I want to stay in, with love in my work and open my heart up to this book that I'm writing. And then you do it with devotion for something that's bigger than yourself. All right. That is my talk. Northwest Cola, don't forget it. <laughs> Put yourself... Put yourself in this beautiful practice ground. Put yourself in it every day with gratitude. Oops. Savoring the del deliciousness of the groundlessness. Okay, so I'm going to open up for questions. Uh, we have, how many minutes do we have? Not too many. Like 10 minutes? Or less? Five minutes? All right. About 10 or 15 minutes. Okay. Maybe 10 minutes. Um, I actually like to set a couple of ground rules. One is keep the sentence, uh, questions short, like a couple of sentences. Don't talk about yourself, and don't try and pitch your uh, whatever it is that you're working on. <laughs> okay. No, I was just looking around the room. I won't get a chance to say uh, thank you personally, so I wanted to do that first. Uh, All right, thank you. In 2008, that's when I first came across your work, and this is when I was reading up on Steve Pavlinan mm -hmm. and Abraham Hicks material. I do notice that you, in 2008, along with Steve, uncopyrighted all of your work and put it to the public domain. I was wondering if it 
uh, affected you negatively in that, like this decade long journey? Yeah. Or it's just. So um, when you write, put something online, a lot of people want to protect their work. And so they protect their copyright. And to protect copyright, you actually have to go after people who keep ripping you off. And online, there's going to be a lot of them, right? If it's good stuff, people will rip it off. So I, I first did that, and I started like sending these messages to people and trying to shut down people. And I'm like, wow, this really doesn't feel right to me. It doesn't feel in alignment with what I was doing. So I uncopyrighted everything that I write, including my books. And what I did was said, rip me off. Like, I'm really glad if you spread my work. And reblog it, put it in your book, put it in your magazine. People have used my stuff all over the place. And I'm actually really happy. I haven't suffered any neg negative consequences. My books still sell. I'm still doing what I, wa what I love doing. And I'm not chasing down the pirates, you know? I was saying, like, use it. It's a gift. And it's, a sh it's the same shift that, that I was talking about from this self-centered point of view to, like, an opening, like, hey, let's all do this together. Like, I didn't actually invent any of this stuff. This is all stolen from, like, <laughs> Buddhism and the Stoics and, you know, Greek philosophers. Yeah, I mean, Henry David Thoreau. All this stuff was written about many years before me, and I just stole it from them and repurposed it, and that's all we all do, right? Yeah, but thanks for the question. Anybody else? Hafidei. Hi. So some bloggers are becoming influencers, and in the influencer era, how do you protect the essence of your work without simply creating content for the sake of creating content? How do I protect the essence of my work and my message without just creating content for the sake of creating content? So I talked about uh, intention. That's where it comes from for me. It's like if, what, if I've actually found myself getting caught up in these cycles of like trying to get more readers, more followers, more all of these things. And so you do these things to get, like you, you start to like really fixate on your metrics, on all of these th like you know, how many people like me on Facebook, right? So, like, you get fixated on that, and that's where the uncertainty comes in. You're like, well, am I worthwhile? Can I make it? But then you start to do things out of the wrong place. Like, that's not actually, you're doing it just to get more followers, but that's not why I started. I started to share my journey and hopefully inspire others. Maybe they learn from me. Maybe I'll learn from them. And so the intention was always this place of, like, wanting to be interconnected, wanting to help each other. And so um, when I find myself moving away from that, which I do, just like anybody else, I'm like, ah, oh, wait a minute, like I gotta stop myself. And that's when I do this practice actually, is just notice what's coming up for me, it's usually uncertainty. And then I can come to this place of interconnection, of love, doing it for the right reasons, and then staying with that intention. As I write, I have to have an intention is my intention to get more followers or is it to like do something good in the world, right? That's, that's it, it's the intention. And we all react out of uh, that place of uncertainty. We all try and grab onto growing more, getting more people to buy our books, you know, like trying to get something from others. But when you start to come from this place of giving, it, um, and I'm not trying to like make myself out to be a saint, like I definitely get caught up in it and I think all of us know what it's like to be caught up in this, like, wanting more. And we all also know what it's like to be caught up in giving. Like, I think every person in this room knows that. So that's, I have to just remind myself, really. Yes, sir. I'd just like to make a short observation of patterns, uh, Leo, and that is that you said that, or it was said that you moved from Guam to San Francisco to simplify your life. I remember a senior professor at the University of Guam who seemed to be doing very well, perhaps on the track towards being president someday, but he, he sacked it all to run for the United States Congress. Yeah, what was that about? And uh, he, 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 he gave it all, he gave up his professorship at the university to run for the United States Congress, and when asked why he would do such a thing, he said he wanted to get away from university politics. <laughs> <laughs> so there wasn't a question, just an observation. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to see you. We won't, we won't allow for rebuttals here. 
I was just curious, how did you actually, how do bloggers actually make money and how, did you, how were you able to turn it over so you could do that for a living? So that was one of my biggest areas of uncertainty when I first started. I'm like, how the hell do you make money doing this? Um, I, I slapped ads on there and I remember the first month I made 30 cents. I was really, really excited. Uh, I quit my day job now. Um, so I tried all kinds of stuff. Ads were one of the biggest ones at first. And um, I, tried, I tried affiliate marketing. Have you ever heard of that? It's crap. Don't do it. Um, yeah, so you're selling other people's stuff and getting a commission, basically. Um, I highly recommend against it. What I learned, the only thing that really works is to do the more of the same. So while I was giving away my work. I basically took that work that I was creating and turned it into a product. So something that I could back. Not an ad that I didn't know what, the, what I was selling. Not someone else's thing, which I probably hadn't even read. Like something that I created. And every time I did that, that's where I made money. So there's ebooks. I did courses, online courses with just a text or also video. I've done a membership program where people pay monthly um, things to uh, m membership fees, and then they get like courses. Like, I have a whole bunch of courses in there. Um, I've also started doing in-person workshops and retreats. Um, let's see. There's a there's a few other models like that, but they're usually some kind of remix of that. Um, now there's a thing called Patreon where people can just support you for creating the great work that you create. So that's another way to do it. I've also done Kickstarter. I w my uh, my second print book. I actually self-published and had that kickstarted and got a bunch of money to print that myself and then I, I kept a portion of that for the profits and, and printed it and just the way that I wanted to. Um, so I've done a couple of kickstarters that were successful. There's a number of, of good ways but that's definitely a big question for anybody as they start. Yes sir. I like your ideas. Uh, I thank you for sharing. I uh, wanted to ask besides the classics are there any more recent inspirations to you? Your life story is someone like Tony Robbins. Yeah. But there's other people I've come across like Jess Stern or Tony Buzan and, and others. Who else has influenced you? Um, uh, so many. That's, that's what I was talking about, the interconnection. Like you, you actually don't know all the people who've influenced you, right? Um, <clears throat> there, uh, lately, it's been a lot of Buddhist uh, teachers. One of my favorites is Pema Chodron. I was talking to my sister about it, her yesterday. Um, she's a Tibetan Buddhist teacher. Highly recommend her book. Um, the, the one that I recommend of hers is called um, When Things Fall Apart, and it's all, all about this. So I stole a lot of stuff from her. Um, there's uh, Zen teachers as well. I have a Zen teacher now, and um, the book that got, started, that got me started was Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. Not actually not a good intro to to what Zen is, but it's still a really deep book. Um, there's a lot of bloggers for sure. I'm trying to think of, I don't know, there were so many. When I started, there was this blog called Get Rich Slowly, and I actually became friends with a guy. And he was, he was all, about, like there's all these get rich quick things, and he was about, let's just pay your debt down, like invest soundly, and like real basic stuff. But it was like, he was so authentic, and his voice really helped me to, to find my own authentic voice. Uh, his name is J.D. Roth, and I actually did a retreat, led a retreat with him, which was really cool. Um, yeah, I don't know, like I said, uh, there I, one book that got me down the path of simplicity was a, a writer in the 90s, Elaine St. James. Uh, she wrote books called like Live the Simple Life, and of course Thoreau before that, but um, there was a, the whole voluntary simplicity movement in the 70s and 60s. Um, that all came and inspired people like me, and I kind of just spread the word because it was already there, but people were craving it. Um, there are uh, the people, so I have simplicity, uh, habits was another big one for me. I, I learned that stuff from the um, like American Cancer Society and like people who are pulling all the science together. So I actually read a lot of people who take science and then make it more accessible. So I, I really like that when some people are look, looking for evidence and like getting the, you know, the, the mass of evidence and what does that say. So I'm always looking for that. And I have a number of people in the health realm where I, that I follow like that. Yeah. One more. One more question. Oh, 
Oh, yes, ma'am. not get affected by this past year in our country? <laughs> oh. Do you, do you? I know, see, that's a bad last question. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, we are all affected by like politics and world events, and it can be very frustrating and maddening, right? Or, I mean, in both sides, like no matter what side you're on, right? And so that's, that's the thing is like, we, that, at that point, we're seeing the uncertainty come up for us. Like, what are, we're actually right now in one of the most uncertain times ever, at least, it always feels like that, but let's just say we are, right? We're in the most uncertain time in history. And, um, and so we lash out, we like get mad at the TV, we, we get mad at the newspaper, and we, we give up in hopelessness and despair because there's nothing we can do about it, right? And um, I think both of the, like that anger and frustration and despair and hopelessness, those are very common ones and they're, they're understandable, but um, not necessarily helpful, right? So that's when we practice this. We're in the middle of uncertainty and we go down Northwest Cola. Dang, I really need a better, better acronym. Um, so we practice, right? And at the middle of that, it's like, what is my intention here in this situation? Can I make a difference? Do I care about the environment? Well, I do, so I donate to organizations that are fighting for, for the environment despite laws being repealed, right? Or, or Paris treaties not being honored, right? So there's still things you can do. And maybe that they're not gonna change the entire world, but again, this is all about interconnection. So if you start to, to take that, then maybe it'll influence the people around you and, and so forth, right? So there's that. But um, there's also a, a place of understanding. And I was influenced here by another Zen teacher who talked about racism in our country and how bad it is. She's a black lesbian Zen teacher, and she was amazing. And she talked about how we can, it's very easy to sit on the other side and judge the other side, right? And that's actually why we're in the place we're in, in racism, in the, you know, um, violence against women, in the violence against the poor, in the violence against the environment, the violence against each other, terrorists, and lashing out at, at politicians. So we get in this place of lashing out and judging, you know, the whole nationalist movement of, of trying to take back America or France or Britain or wherever you're from is about like judging and like not wanting the other. And once we start allowing for the other, this place of like this, I walk into this room, you guys are all others, and I'm me, right? That's when we start to divide and feel like they're separate from us and we need to do something about it. And so if we can start to not allow for the other, and once we, do, once we allow for the other, we lose a piece of our humanity. If we can start to open up and say, actually, we're all interconnected. Trump is me, you know, and I believe that. There's, there's a, a part of me and him, and, and him and me, and actually we're the same. There's no difference between us. And if, I can, if once I start to open myself up to that, then I think everything changes. In me, maybe in him, I don't know. But definitely in people around me. And um, so that's what I do. I'm not saying it's the solution to all of life's problems, but hopefully it'll help. Thank Thanks, you guys. very much. Thank you. How about another round of applause here for Neil? Good job. I want to add, uh, I know you're a minimalist and I want to add to your clutter. <laughs> I'll keep it at my mom's house. Okay, so I, I don't know what you're going to do with it as long as I don't see it on eBay, you know. But uh, it says uh, 35th uh, speaker, University of Guam Presidential Lecture Series, Leo Babauta. April 24th, 2018. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I just want to thank the people in this room, especially in the back row, who, uh, those are my family members. Like, they've, like, so supported me through all these years. And it's not just me up here, it's all of them. Love you guys. <laughs>